Aggression is one of the last dirty words in our culture. You can be crass, you can be rude, you can even be profane, but ho oh, ho, aggressive, don't be aggressive, except it's wrong, dead wrong. I promise you nothing of meaning and transcendence will come into your life passively. It's time for you to get into the arena to push back against a passive, mediocre existence. I'm Brian Tome, and this is The Aggressive Life. Welcome to The Aggressive Life. I'm your host, Brian Tome, and today I'm going to have a very special guest. She's very special because she's a she. The very first guest we've had in our inaugural run at The Aggressive Life. This is not a man podcast. It just so happens that I'm a man and all of our guests to date have been men. Today, I've got Teresa Tanner. You might say, who is Teresa Tanner? Teresa Tanner is, was a banker. (gasps) A banker, you might say. (gasps) A banker. What does a banker have to do with the aggressive life? What does a banker have to do who's, who's always fretting that something might go wrong and making sure everybody, everything is conservative? What do they have to tell us about aggression? Well, I'll tell you what, if there was a banker who had something to tell us about aggression, it would be one who was named the most powerful woman in banking. (laughs) An actual award, (laughs) the most powerful woman in banking. Her name is Teresa Tanner. Welcome to The Aggressive Life. Thank you, Brian. Glad to be here. And what does one have to do to get named the most powerful woman in banking? I don't know what one has to do, but um, it is actually one of 25 most powerful women in banking, and it's across the U.S. And uh, we really looked towards um, C-suite executive women that can pave the way for others and um, drive significant change in their organization and for the industry. So did you wake up one day and say, by golly, I want to be a banker? I did not. There's a lot of things in life that I never thought I wanted to be. Um, But opportunities arose, and uh, I took the leap. As a matter of fact, I grew up in the restaurant industry. I, at a very early age, began working for McDonald's um, in a similar way that a lot of people begin working for McDonald's. We need gas money. We need going out money. And never did I think I would end up being there 18 years, but was inspired by an entrepreneur who had 100 restaurants. And uh, I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to own my own business. I want to create my own way. And so I spent many years going uh, through that operational track. I worked both nationally, internationally with the company and just thought that was my road. And uh, throughout that career, I got a knock on the door to go into HR. And I thought that was the most ridiculous idea anybody had ever posed. I agreed to do it for two years, but... Uh, made them write a contract back in to operations, and then just taking that risk and opening that door um, took me on a whole different track. And the same thing happened with banking. I didn't think I would leave McDonald's. An opportunity came along, and I thought, oh, my goodness, why would I want to be a banker? Um, But that ended up also being one of the best risks I took. When you were climbing the 80s, 90s, whatever that was, that wasn't the same as the last 10 years to be a woman in corporate America. No, not at all. And I was lucky to have a lot of good mentors along the way to learn from. Um, But I also learned at an early age that um, I needed to um, be aggressive and be assertive in my career and take risk and to raise my hand and to find my voice and, um, and do the right thing and contribute in a way that I felt um, was going to uh, help the company be successful. An aggressive woman. Isn't that a bad thing, being an aggressive woman? Well, I actually had a coach early in my career um, advise me not to be aggressive. And she said, Teresa, it's okay to be assertive, but you might want to dial down on the aggression. Um, There are times when, you know, you put your idea out there first and maybe you could read the room and wait for other people to speak. And quite candidly, um, was told that I should hold my voice back. Mm. And um, her her input was that um, being assertive and, you know, making sure that your voice was heard, but but do it in, in, a, in a very mild way and maybe do it second and not first. 
um, that was advice that didn't resonate with me, quite frankly. And um, I have found that um, it is important to really be the first in line to carry the flag, especially when it's something you believe in and you know it's the right thing. Um, to, to sit back and hold that back, I find irresponsible. You've accomplished a lot. You've done a lot. Was there a time in your life when you realized, I'm going to do a lot with my life? Was there a time in your life where you felt special, where you felt different? I will tell you, Brian, when I was very young, probably in my early 20s, I struggled with confidence and I struggled with finding my voice and I had no idea what I had to offer. And um, I had a manager at the time and he became a great mentor and we were sitting and talking about my development and he had asked me what I wanted to do and at the time my dreams were small and um, he listened to it for a while and then he leaned in and he looked at me and he said, Teresa, he said, I want to tell you what's going to happen one day. He said, one day you will be very well known. He said, even in this organization, we are a global organization and people across this country will know your name and they will know that you're contributing from a system-wide perspective. And he tells me this thing and I, I remember trembling. I'm thinking, who's he talking to? And I'm looking around because surely that can't be me. And the gift he gave me that day, Brian, was seeing something in myself that I couldn't yet see. And I remember years later, I was working at McDonald's on an international project, and an email announcement went through the system about this role I was, I was holding around change management. My phone rang, and that same guy was on the other end. At that point, I hadn't heard from him in years. And he says, I told you. Wow. And that was just such... That, that was such a pivotal moment wow. for me because it was just such a gift that he said, you have something, you have a gift, and the only way you won't be able to achieve is because you don't believe. So when he said that, you, you believe that actually elevated your game and took you to a new level when he said that? Absolutely. Why do you think that is when someone speaks life to us? in that way, in an aggressive way, that actually we rise to it. Why, why do you think that is? I think it gives us a window into um, into something that we can't see. Yes. And it allows us to step outside of ourselves. And because, you know, sometimes the, the words and the things we tell ourselves, the stories we tell ourselves are the most damning, right? They're, they're the most damaging. Um and having somebody pull you out from all of that, that negative headspace and say, what are you thinking? You need to look at this a different way because what you see is not what I see. And sometimes you need some of those tough conversations and loving conversations to have people pull you out and have you look at things differently. Yes. So I made a huge mistake early in my career. I, uh, with, without giving you all the boring details, I wasted a couple hundred thousand dollars of the company's money. Well, at least it's the company's money, not your money. Yeah, yeah. It was bad, though. It was, I, uh, I was aggressive. I thought I could solve a problem creatively um, outside of the framework of how we should have. And I uh, very honorably uh, wrote out a resignation letter and folded it and slid it across the table to that good boss mentor I was telling you oh, about. Oh, the same guy I told the you. The same wow. guy. He reads the letter. He's turning red. His neck is popping out, and he said, are you kidding me? And I said, what? And he throws the, the resignation back at me, and he said, I just spent $200,000 on your development. You're going to learn, and you're going to pay it back. You are not going to quit. And it taught me a lesson about leadership, but it also taught me a lesson about failure, right? You know, sometimes who we— Who is this man? I is his know, name right? Jesus? Who, no. is, who is he? No. Moses? No. Who is this man? His name is Brian. Not really. Uh, not really. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. But like, right, we need to give people permission to fail, right? Now, yes. don't keep making the same dumb mistake over. But, you know, you you were and, – and in that situation, I failed because I was being aggressive. And so I'd much rather pay somebody to be aggressive and make mistakes than play it safe and, and never have that breakthrough performance. That's excellent. Yeah. If I were to ask you – what is one thing that you didn't do 
that you wished you had a more aggressive attitude towards? What might that be? Ironically, I would have found my voice earlier. Hmm. And yeah, most people that know me today would go, hmm, you have a pretty strong voice. And I'm kind of known for saying what no one else will say and being the first to jump in and pushing issues no one else will push. So um, people that know me today would find that interesting and probably unbelievable, but it is true. Um, when I was young, I was too quiet, and huh. I didn't take the opportunity to advocate for the things I should have. I wish I'd have started that a lot earlier. Over the last 10 years or so, I've had something hanging on my computer that I read every single day, and it starts with, never be afraid to be fired. And it says, because if you are afraid to be fired— either for financial reasons or because your job is tied to your identity, whatever those reasons are. If you're afraid to be fired, then you are going to lose the ability um, to do the right thing and to um, offer unpopular counsel. And it is also going to tempt you to compromise your morals. And every day I've read that for 10 years, and every day I've tried to structure my life to say, I'm just going for it, right? I'm going to do the right thing, whatever that is. And if I lose, the worst thing that can happen is I'm fired. And I wish I would have spent all 30 years of my career with that same intensity because it, it matters. You can drive so much change. You can have the right conversations. Um, you can shape a culture if you're willing to live that kind of aggressive life. Wow. So younger people who are in the business world right now or the social sector, whatever sector they are then, go ahead, give your pep talk to them. What should they, what, how should they be thinking about work? How should they, should be, they be going forward? Well, I think they should, they should go forward with purpose and on purpose, right? So often we just kind of wake up and we go to work every day and we do the same thing and the job's good enough and it's paying the bills, but it's directionless. And so when I talk to young people and people my age, it's all about living life on purpose and being very thoughtful about what you're doing and why you're doing it and knowing what you're trying to achieve. You know, what is the end game here and making sure that you're learning along the way. Okay. If we take this outside of work, mm -hmm. the attitude of going for it, is that showing up in other places of your life? Well, I like to do reckless things, as my husband would say. Oh, you do? Um, like but... <laughs> what? Tell us. What are those reckless things? You know, I've never found a roller coaster I didn't like. I love bungee jumping. Um, bungee jumping. I love to bungee jump. How many times jump. you bungee jumped? I can't even count. So really? many, so many times. I yes. just did my first bungee jump uh, a couple months ago. Isn't it fun? It, yes, but I'm really bummed out about, by how I behaved. I got well. I got up to the up to the. Um, the place on the edge. The platform, The right? platform, and I was over a little body of water, and uh, the guys, they're, they're, they're dialing in how much I weigh and all that stuff, and the one that I was going to, and, and the guy said, uh, okay, do you want to touch the water with the top of your head, not touch the water, go into your waist? And I was like, uh, uh, go in my waist. He said, okay. Okay, um, so when you when you jump off, just make sure you've got your hands above your head, or it'll really hurt. And I'm like, and I thought to myself, of course, of course, that's like this is like diving off a high dive, of course, right? So when I jumped off, my, I immediately was putting my hands and arms in the right position above my head, and then. Unlike my friends who were jumping out and looking around at people, I didn't see anything. I jumped and shut my eyes the whole time. Oh. I know. I missed the whole thing. <laughs> and then once it happened, I thought, what am I doing? And as it was, they got the tension wrong anyway. I never even got wet. Bum me out. Yeah, I was getting a little worried when you were talking about all those options. It makes me worry about the math and the tension. You know, that's an important component. Completely it is. As a banker, you would know these things. Yes. So bungee jumping, what else do you like doing? Um, well, I'd like just normal, non-risky things, too, like cooking and being with my family and reading and gardening. This is not a man podcast. It's not a woman podcast. It's a podcast about aggression. But there is something I've been thinking about a lot. I've been trying to get people's opinions on it. I'd like to get yours. Okay. A whole new one for us as men, a totally, totally new one, is women are going to out-earn you. Mm -hmm. You know, we have... I have increasing amount of guys I know they're having to wrestle with. I know there's nothing wrong with it, but boy, it just feels weird that my wife out earns me. Mm -hmm. 
Do you see those things? What do you think about that? I said, man, we just got to get over it. Or can you give us some tips as to how to navigate the future or any of it or any um, women tips to how to, how to handle a man who's got a small ego and it has a bruised, a bruised thing going on there. Have you thought about this much? Well, my husband and I have talked about this a lot. Oh, good. So there's a reason I brought it up. We've talked about it a lot um, because we don't we don't follow a traditional path. And we spent many years talking about what was right for our family. And I do think, Brian, so often we, we struggle with these things because there are social norms that are in place. And some of them are in place for good reason. And some of them I think we have an opportunity to challenge. And... Um, for us, I do out-earn my husband, and when we began to look at our career trajectories over the last 10 or 20 years, um, we could clearly see well in advance which career trajectory had the biggest payoff financially. Um, but that wasn't always the only consideration, of course, but we had to think about what was the right thing for our family. And um, as our kids were growing up, we saw a need to have a parent more actively involved. And, you know, I think when you have little kids, you think, oh, when they get to be teenagers, you know, it'll be easier. Well, they won't need as much supervision. And then you learn that they probably need more supervision. And so we began talking about how do we do this parenting thing together. And he made, we made a conscious choice to have him step back and stay home mm. um, while I doubled down on the career. And it was um, an uncomfortable decision for both of us at the time because you get the raised eyebrows. And, yeah, that's how long ago now? Oh, that was 10 years ago now. Wow, yeah. Right. So close to 10 years ago now. So you get, you know, the raised eyebrows and what? He isn't working and you're making more than him. And, you know, it, but for us, that is the right answer. And it was the right answer. And um, he worked as hard as I did, very differently. And the measure of success isn't always in the paycheck or the title or the status. Um, it is about both parents, both husband and wife, working very, very hard for the success of your family. And for us, that was defined differently than um, maybe most people define it. But I think we need to be more open-minded about how to solve these problems as well. So let's, all, let's just assume that we're all open-minded here right now because – increasing numbers of us are having to have these discussions and are just faced with these realities. What worked for you? What didn't work for you? What should we be thinking about in this? What worked for us is to really look at it as a single unit. I, I personally don't have the, um, the perception that I out-earn my husband. I have the perception that this is what we bring to the family financially. And um, he contributes to that financial um, success just as much as I do. And so we have looked at it as we have different skill sets, we have different roles, we have different things we need to contribute to that family union at different times. And so for us, what has helped is to look at that truly in a joint way um, and as a team, as a true team. That's fantastic. Okay, so you come home at night and you're talking with your husband. Like what, what are the kind of things that you say to – embrace that value or to pump him up? What, does, what are the kind of things that he says to embrace that value or to pump you up? Well, first of all, I'll start with him because he has always been my biggest cheerleader, my biggest source of support and strength. And he does not let his own personal ego get in the way of our family's success. Um, and I have always appreciated that. And, and for me, I respect him so much for that because I don't think it's an easy thing for him to do. On the other hand, I have to also understand that he has some natural um, things that he needs to do. He needs to have dude friends. He needs to have dude time. He needs to have a farm and ride a tractor. So we got that. And now he does that. And so, <laughs> um, you know, seven or eight years ago, we bought a little hobby farm about an hour away and, and he helps us grow crops for our family and takes care of that property. So it's also important to make sure that as we may have to wear different hats and contribute to the family differently, we also need to respect that there are basic needs that we have, and we have to figure out creative ways to let um, those needs be fulfilled. Boy, that's really interesting, Teresa, and really, really insightful. I'm just going, I'm going in the catalog in my mind of 
uh, guys who I know who have taken the traditional stay-at-home parent role, mm -hmm. which, by the way, you and your husband, very aggressive move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very aggressive move to be thinking about this and to go after a different way. That's really, really, really cool. But as I just think about my own mental Rolodex of guys I know have done that, it's, it's interesting that everyone I can think of right now has kind of a stereotypical manly hobby they throw themselves into. Mm -hmm. So you just mentioned one, right? Mm -hmm. Farming, tractoring. Right. Ah, ah, you know, I'm out working the, working the land with my hands. <laughs> That's you know? right. I mean, seriously. And for the record, I am not allowed on the tractor. As no woman should. <laughs> Come on now. I, I believe in equal treatment of the sexes until it comes to a woman sitting on a man's piece of machinery. I, I agree. That's... I better uh -huh. make sure I word that right. Okay, yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, what's the name of this podcast again? Uh, uh, okay, but back over. But like, I know guys who are like they're hardcore into, like hardcore into guns as one example. Like really, really into it. And I yeah. think his wife just goes along with it because it's a way for him to. I don't know, keep his virility in his own mind or something. I don't Another one, hard, hardcore into like motorcycles. Um, I don't know. I, I don't even know. I can't even make a commentary on it. Just until you said that, I, I realized there, there's kind of a theme there. It's true. And, and the advice I give to other women who are considering this path is that, right? We have different needs and it's awesome that – um, we can flex our muscles and play different roles in the family. But it's also important that um, we each have um, the things that, that drive us and fulfill us and fill us. And for him, it is some of those manly things. And, and I, I'm glad that he gets an outlet to do it. I think what's important for, for a man is to feel like a man. And unfortunately, many guys don't know how to feel like a man. They take advantage of women or they just buy a bunch of expensive toys and mm -hmm. make themselves feel like they're out earning or out spending somebody else. Um, but guys, we have to feel manly. You can finger paint and be a man. You can drive a minivan and be a man. It's not about those external trappings. There's just something about internally, you, you have to feel like you're not sacrificing your soul. And for a lot of guys, if they are earning less, they might be tempted to feel that, but they got to be able to hang their hat on something else. Right. <laughs> I'm adding value here, or I'm protecting Teresa this way because I'm a protector, or I'm a, you know, we've got to, we can't just say to guys, I don't think, well, that's the way it is. Just get over it. We've, we've got to, we've got to be aware that there's probably more emotional things that are going on. It sounds like you've been a whiz at that's, that's impressive. Well, but you also mentioned protection. And, and when I think about earning, I think about provision, right? And, and a husband providing for his family. And there are other ways that that needs to happen than just financially. And so, you know, having my husband as a great protector, and, and he is that, and having him as um, a provider of, you know, other you know, emotional needs and things like that. That That is just as important to me as financial provision. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. So get to the C-suite, like hardly anybody gets the C-suite. You know, male, female, hardly anybody gets the C-suite in a, in a Fortune 500 company, way, way, way up there. Like virtually nobody does that. And you're leaving it. You're leaving yeah. it. Why, why are you leaving it? What are you going to do? Well, I've been thinking about this for a long time. So I went away on my 50th birthday about a year ago, and I knew I was going to do this for many years. I told my husband in my early 40s, when I turn 50, I'm just going to take a pause. I'm going to go away all by myself. I'm not going to answer emails or phone, and I'm just going to kind of um, just just evaluate where I'm at in life, and not just from a career, but relationally, um, a personal growth perspective. I'm just going to take stock, and I'm going to figure out, am I headed on all the right paths, and do I need to adjust? And I'm going to spend some time with God, and we're going to talk about it, and I'm going to come back with um, some conclusions. And um, my career was something that was on my mind. I loved my career, loved my job love the company. There's not anything noticeably wrong. Um, but I also know that I do have a passion and a talent around pouring into people. And I do have a passion or a passion and a talent around creating 
new solutions to old problems. And I love that I've been able to use the corporate big co platform to do that. And it's a convenient platform, right? There's resources, there's influence, there's money that inherently comes with all of that. Um, but I only get to do it a portion of the time. And um, I had a decision to make. Could I continue doing what I'm doing right now for another 15 years? It's very comfortable. Um, and I could just settle in and keep doing that. Or I could kind of jump off that platform, if you will, and I could choose to create a different experience. And I'm not really known for settling in. Um, so settling in did not feel like the right thing for me for the next 15 years. And so I'm going to go jump and do something completely different. And I'm going to wake up every day just focusing on those things. So you've jumped away from the bank. I have. Have you jumped into anything else yet? I am uh, circling around things you are. Okay. Uh, right now, and there are a lot of um, interesting things that I had already thought about and some new ones being proposed. I have promised my husband and my family, though, that I'm going to take a little sabbatical Good. Um, and uh, pour back into them right now. There's a lot of sacrifices that your family makes when you're doing a job like this. So okay. I want to take um, some time to rest and to... Um, strengthen relationships, play a little, and then I'll get back at it. You have two kids. I do. Boys, girls, one of each, what? One of each. One of each. I hate to keep putting you in the woman box, but you are the first woman that we've had on the aggressor. I got another one scheduled coming up. Um, I just think the, the idea of femininity and aggressiveness is just really fresh. Is there anything you need to uniquely do for your daughter to set her up for success that you might not need to uniquely do for your son because he's still in a male-dominated culture? Is there anything you, you have to think of? Like, what I'm asking here is help moms and dads think about how best to, to set their daughters up for success. For daughters especially, I think it's so important to help build confidence and help them find voice um, because it's really easy to take a back seat and to... Um, believe that you're less than. And so really helping to empower young girls at a at an early age, I think, is very important. How would you do that? Again, allowing them to see the potential and the talent they have, allowing them to experiment, allowing them to be aggressive in their way. Um, but also, you know, also leaning into men and women are going to be aggressive in different ways. Um, and oh, you, you think so? I do. Oh, I, talk about that. I do. I think that, um, and 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 not to say one is right or wrong, but here here is a story that reminds me of it. And if you just think about workplace inclusion and and how we we read different emotions, you know, when when a man is angry, some things that you might see people describe or hear people describe is oh, they were cussing, their face got red, they're pounding on the table. You know, I knew he was angry because of this. Um, a woman might show that she's angry through tears, right? Mm. But that's very misunderstood, right? A man may look at a woman and say, oh, she's crying, she's upset. No, she's mad. She's really mad. But that aggression comes out of her. She, she, her emotional representation of that aggression is very different than yours. Um, and that is, that's a, an example from a, a negative aggression emotion, right? Anger. Um, but there are also positive aggression emotions that are going to be different. You know, women may, their voice may get more high pitched. They may talk more rapidly. They may lean in and that um, may, may come across as overbearing. No, they're aggressively pursuing a concept um, and that's going to, it's going to be manifest in a different way than a man would manifest it. Mm. Teresa, this has been very enlightening. I wish I would have had this conversation with you a long, long time ago because the women in my life would be much, much better off and I <laughs> myself personally would have been much, much better off. Is there anything else out there related to this topic that you just want to make sure that you get in there? Any any last story, any last advice, any last counsel? Uh, like, hey, I'm not going to leave here until I say this. Do you got anything in that area? The only thing I would end with is just be willing to take risk. If I look back on... Uh, my life, both personally and professionally, it is about um, just leaping into the unknown 
and believing in um, your abilities and um, the purpose for which you're you're living. Well said, Teresa Tanner, boys and girls. It's fantastic having you with us today. We can't wait to see what your next phase in your life is. And we know it's going to be great. You've made great decisions come to now, and we know the next one's going to be fantastic. So thanks for sharing your wisdom with us, Teresa. Thank you, Brian. Hey, thanks for listening. If this episode has impacted you, hey, share it with somebody else. All of us have influence, people that can look to us for direction. Use your influence positively, aggressively. And if this has meant something to you, then pass it along to those that you're leading. Uh, you can see more at bryantome.com or search me on Instagram. Special thanks to the band Judges for our music. You can find more from them on Instagram at the band Judges or at facebook.com slash the band Judges. The Aggressive Life with Brian Tome is a production of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, Ohio. Mm-hmm.